That is one gorgeous entry, Gabi. I mean, <laughs> beautiful pastel-like colors and, and subtle shifts uh, and contrasts. Just really an exceptional, another exceptional orchestration. Let's start from the... Um, from the end and move back. We'll we'll uh, just getting back to my original plan of evaluating things in reverse order. So we'll do section E first, and then jump back to D, and then we'll look at the beginning of the piece up to C. All right. So let's start at E. Um, now I'm, I'm noticing how you are are building up to this. Um, you've got you know you <laughs> sort of have the climax. Um, of uh, power right here. Um, and then you drop down to mezzo forte and push again, but remove elements. Uh, that's, a, that's an interesting strategy, um, you know, just focusing uh, a lot of power in the mid range, but actually while simultaneously, um, you know, getting rid of weight uh, in, uh, in other registers. It's, I'd, I'd say that it's it's very well planned, um, you know, rather than being random. But I mean, I'm not so sure how you know how powerful the clarinets will be up against the horns like this, right? And especially with both of them playing forte, you could bring the clarinets up to fortissimo here, uh, but then you still kind of have the problem of just you know. I still think the timbre weight is is still not quite equal, so I don't think you have solved all of your balance problems here. Uh, the biggest problem that I had with the bar at E itself, though, is um, is right here, where you are extending this pitch into the bar, right? And I think Barvinsky wants everything to fade out that is not a B octave. Now, of course, I mean, like, if you feel differently, that's fine, but I'm just telling you what, what I think, you know, even diminuendo down to pianissimo by the middle of the bar, which, if that's what you intend, you should have a, you have, um, you should tie, um, you should have tied half notes here, um, with a diminuendo on the first half, sorry, tied dotted half notes, with a diminuendo on the first dotted half note, and then the triple P mark under the second one, right? And that would give you more, um, it, would, it would just be clearer to the, to your third horn player. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, see, see, this is a third horn part. And I see, like, and you're pairing up the, I, I would, I would still give this, um, this lower part to the third and have the second play this. The the functions are a little strange. This really is more of a second horn part. Okay, but be that as it may, um, <clears throat> you know, we're ending up with the pitch of, of G, below, G below middle C, excuse me, um, pushing forward into this harmony. And I, I just feel that it, you know, it if it were to fade out <clears throat> like all the other instruments, then I think that it would just be cleaner here. Now, I also have a problem with you going fortissimo diminuendo to piano here. I think that this should stay strong and then diminuendo with everybody else but remain sitting there at piano. I, I, I just, yeah, I just feel that like, I mean, I, I see what you're doing here, but yeah, this is strange. There's a, <laughs> there's a stray um, uh, dynamic marking in the, in the harp. Um, I wonder what that is there for. Maybe just something skipped up or or jumped um, from another part. Okay, so um, those are just my feelings about that. And then here you have bass drum with a fermata on it on a dotted uh, whole note. And you know, I mean, the music is just really not going that fast to justify that. Um, I I think a single stroke. See see what you have to understand, Gabi, is that the is that the hall is the resonant is the resonating chamber for the bass drum, right? So giving the bass drum a long, uh, like a long duration, I mean, you know, it's subjective. You just want to keep you want the the um, the drum head to keep vibrating, fine. But really, it the um, the actual quality of sustain is is pretty low 
unless you know unless the bass drum is tuned down a little bit so that it's a little more flabby but you know or, or you, unless you've got one of those like huge verdi dr bass drums um but you know just generally speaking i think it's it's a little wasted you know i mean it's it's not going to make a, a huge amount of difference whether you score a a quarter note or a dotted whole note right um is the hall <clears throat> is going to be the resonant chamber right and see that this is it's that's that is the that's the truth at the core of it which makes me question long durations more than like saying oh well you know will it really will the duration keep going that's the that's really a side issue um the the main issue is like where is the sound coming from is it coming from the head is it coming from the shell no it's coming from the hall right so all right um but everything else very cool and uh, I love the way you keep it in the strings here. Um, and um, I, I think that you should fade out this uh, last little beam group in your double basses so that you get a nice, clear uh, transition to the cellos. Honestly speaking, you, know, you, could, you might have easily dovetailed on this note here, right? And just gone straight into the, and, and you know, probably would not have made much of a difference um, the main thing is to avoid too much weight here, right? So you could start pianissimo, crescendo to piano, and then here fade out to pianissimo, right? So just, or just, just have a diminuendo. And then you get a beautiful, smooth transition if that's what you want. All right. Now, you are giving the, the sort of um, the, the upper part, the upper accompaniment part to the vibraphone. And... The only thing that I see here that's problematic is that um, the vibraphone has such an intimate sound, right? And you are asking it to kind of hover over and give harmonic context context from above to it, it much more resonant, resonant fluid instruments, right? So whereas most people have, you know, elected to score this in the winds, which, you know, really have a, have a nice clear sound um and and continue you know, maintain their their power right the vibraphone decays fairly quickly so um yeah so it's just yeah okay and then then i think um there's a problem here um ba -da 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 -dum. and then see here you give the bees um to your to your vibraphone um, that are part of the melody, right? And I just got to get, yeah, get my original score up here. Sorry for the delay. Okay, yeah, so <clears throat> so we have the octave Bs here. B, and then what happens after that? Octave Bs, right? Then octave A. And then a full E minor chord, right? So, um, <clears throat> so the problem here is that this B it does not become part of an ongoing melody in the strings, and then you're adding these um, these harmonic pitches above them, right? So, so the the melodic continuity is not as clear as it could be here, um, you know, with the lack of 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 the you know of adding say if you were to add in in the second violins and and then tracking the cellos from above <clears throat> but you know i understand you're just experimenting you're subtracting some things adding some other things and here you're going to a triple octave <laughs> right um yeah Bum, 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 bum. You know, one thing that I would say about in the mock-up, it just really feels fast. Do you know what I mean? It, the, the, I feel that this ending should have more of a pensive quality. And you, you really have scored some beautiful stuff here. And it's going by so quickly. Uh, it feels like the listener doesn't have time to really absorb it or, or you know, or to calm down after the big climax. Uh, consider, you know, consider 
bringing the tempo down a little bit. Listen to Violina Petrochenko's tempo. That, that's absolutely perfect. Um, it's just, you know, it's a, a bit a bit slower. I mean, it doesn't have to be incredibly slower, but just enough for the audience to catch their breath. I feel that the audience just doesn't get a chance to. And then right here at the end, you say Morendo, but you don't, you know, Morendo doesn't mean um, retardando as much as it means dying away, right? It means to... And you have a, a very, you know, a very severe rollentando here. So, yeah, so there just, just needs a little bit of work, I think, on the tempo for the mock-up and, and for, you know, your perception. Because, like, you're saying tempo quasi one, but it's a bit, it seems a bit faster to me, right? So maybe, you know, maybe some clarification is in order here. Right, and then um, with your, you've got your triple, um, you've got your triple octave, and then bassoons, um, with the vibraphones. Right, uh, da da da, bum 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 bum. I have to say, it's all really gorgeous. Um, uh, one one thing I'm sort of missing here because of the, uh, the vibraphones character is we don't really get that sense of. Of that implied leap, da da dum ba dum. So, um, without changing very much in your orchestration, perhaps if the um, if you were to mark this first dotted half note with a um, with a tenuto mark, and then a slur to the next uh, um, to the next dotted half note thirds. Uh, so I think that that would make that would, you know, bring that part out. Right. Yeah, and maybe just a little diminuendo there, right? So that these these are not the so this is louder and that is a little softer. Right. And you know, and, and also we need a we possibly might need a little fading away, right? Because here you're going to piano in this part. And here I imagine that this is intended to be piano as well, right? And that's what's in you know, there is you know there there is an implied diminuendo here as well so you might want to you know but i mean it doesn't it could just start you can just drop down to piano too it doesn't have to be a diminuendo all right yeah and th this is one part right here like at that faster tempo it just feels like it goes by too fast yeah da 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 dum um yeah But I mean, I I think it I think it more or less works the the way that you've scored this out. And it's just beautiful color uh, between uh, <clears throat> middle strings and uh, bassoon and and double reeds. Beautiful idea. Now you know this really is a lot of weight on you know for for wrapping things up. But I mean, it's an intriguing idea to just really have a very colorful almost forceful uh, mixture um, of, of timbre here, but still, you know, at a, at a mezzo piano. Yeah. yeah, you know, I mean, not, not my choice of doing things, but I think you make it work really nicely. And then a nice roll. Yeah, you know, um, <clears throat> you have a very pleasant sound set that you're using but i must say that the the harp sort of sounds like it was it was recorded in a closet for for some reason it just really feels kind of um it, it doesn't feel like the harpist is sitting on stage with an orchestra it feels like it was recorded um separately um you know in the in the playback hmm yeah, well, I mean, a good contrast if you think that here you have a thick, uh, blended sound, and then you have a beautiful solo sound with the clarinet. It's a great. That's a great contrast there too. And then just a touch of timpani. You know, once again, I mean, this 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 uh, uh, duration is not going to last to the end of the bar. So. Um, you know, I, I just th I think that <laughs> I, I I think that it might just be a little much. Um, a lot of these long durations, 
um, you know, like you might get the same exact effect out of just a single quarter note, right? Just the, the same sense. Because it, you have to think, you already have a note that is holding that duration, right? With a, the roll in the harp. So you have the same exact D, and if we're playing softly and everybody is balanced, that means the harp pitch is going to last longer than the timpani anyway, and is going to have more character so it, to its sustain. So anytime you have that, it kind of cancels out the need to do this in the timpani. Whereas it's a single stroke, boom, right? And it's, it's fine. The the harp is really the is the beautiful sound that you want to have a, have a longer duration here. It's kind of strange. You have, I mean, what's the other voice? What's going on here? Having having a um, like a first and second voice with one of them in a rest. Um, uh, yeah, and then yeah, and xylophone over. This horn solo here. <laughs> it's just so, such such fun ideas here. Okay, you know about like my personal preference probably would not be to um, like as an as a line is descending down to the bottom of the orchestra to suddenly jump in with a doubling from way above, just because like the 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 line is descending and it's going down there and it is leading us there, and so the focus of our attention. It, it, uh, according to my, to my way of thinking, you do not have to agree, would be that things like the, the, the audience is really focusing on this, right? And right as you get to here, and we should really be pulling down to this beautiful ending, suddenly you come in above, right? So, oh, suddenly we're listening to the English horn. Where did that come from? So, I, I mean, you, you feel it, you hear it, you should score it, and you should see you know, if it works, right? So for me, you know, I felt it was a distraction, but it is beautiful effect. It's not, it's, it's not to say that it was poorly scored or anything. I thought it was fantastic. Um, but is it perhaps a distraction in the, in the proportion of the work? Uh, and then this, this ending chord is very cool. I almost feel if you are going to have the, the horn on top, you know, like th like this is the end of the line, right? So it's going all the way. This is this is where our attention is being focused in the English horn part. And here you're asking the for there to be a pitch above it, right? In in a much stronger instrument. So I think that you should mark this triple P here at the end. Okay, and then I think this will be will be balanced. Uh, such a cool ending. And there are really, really great things that lead up to it. So let's go take a look at those. Looking at this, the way that you've got it scored, you've got um, so many lovely touches in here and and variations and, and even, you know, just going throughout all of D, <laughs> you're constantly shifting around um, the the quality of texture, the functions between the instruments. And I think that that really tells a story beautifully. Um, it's it's really cool to go to, um, uh, you know, uh, just the the written in compound time triplets um, here in the in the xylophone against the um, these little looping sixteenths. Uh, uh, yeah, I just. <laughs> Some really fun stuff. So, um, so yeah, let's let's take a look at how it's all put together. So, um, uh, oboe, uh, clarinet down here, um, and your uh, first and second violins. It's a, you know, it's a, it is, it's a, an intriguing. Um, like reharmonization of of the part, and I, I think it does work. I mean, we're we're sort of you know it, you know you're aware that you're sort of losing some of the um, some of the lower harmony, and and then that is corrected like as the as the um, flute and oboe and clarinet take over here with a doubling from the viola. I mean, it's just just to just sit here and explain everything you're doing would take hours, but. 
<clears throat> but I feel that this works really nicely and I really appreciate that you have really brought everything down to a very soft level and and then balanced the uh, the harp and the xylophone against it. Now, um, some of the some of your crescendo markings are a little, you know, a little inconsistent. Like, you know, saying piano, you know, maybe poco poco crescendo. I mean, it's almost like you could have just put a hairpin on this and a hairpin on that, and then got to mezzo forte this way. If you know what I mean. And then, yeah, poco poco crescendo to mezzo forte. It's perfectly okay in a passage like this to put the dynamics at the bottom, right? It's just it's just easier to read uh, for the harpist. Yeah, so, um, you know, our functions of cascading octaves, I think is the most intriguing part of this entire orchestration right in here. So, you know, starting off from uh, xylophone, trading off to uh, down here to cellos and your texture is light enough here to where you can pretty much just keep the the bottom part of those octaves in the cellos for the first half of that section and i, I think it works pretty well um just keeping it for between xylophone and cellos to begin with and then you know you're trading off to piccolo flute going to the bassoons who are assisting now, just adding a little bit of their weight, and then you have a little bit of contra bassoon as the um, as the strings cascade down, and uh, you know joined by xylophone one more time. So I think that it I think that that really helps a lot. Now <clears throat> when we get to this point, ya da 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 dum. I, get, I I see by your note here you're concerned about like like what does the interpretation of the piano like? Well, you know the the entire rationale for the octaves being lower, um, you know, the cascading octaves being an octave lower in that bar is so that the left hand of the pianist can jump up and reach them without having to go so far and so quickly, right? But that doesn't mean that you have to, right? Just because the, uh, the octaves are adjusted downwards in the piano score for those two bars so that the pianist can reach them, that doesn't mean that you have to do that. I, I'm, I'm, I, I can't recall exactly the um, everything I said in the um, in the pitfalls, but I might have mentioned that. So, so yeah, so like, so just watch out for things like that. You do not have to do everything. Like, I mean, obviously, since you're not doing everything that is is in the piano score anyway, why you know why have your octaves fall to a point where they're kind of indistinguishable uh, against the functions of the other instruments, right? You know, in terms like they don't cascade anymore; they just they just become a middle voice. So yeah, um, so I would say watch out for that. But I mean, it is a it is a good way for you to sort of bring things down and then build back up again, all the way up to the piccolo. So um, so yeah, so not bad. And then that just becomes a, the part of the push into the next section. So you know, I I get it. I understand why. <clears throat> so. You know, from you know, from here we go to there, right? In terms of of like having a nice strong um, uh, accompaniment power and and um, and distribution of the melody, you know, and the octaves to the to the trombone and the and the um, um, those thirds here and being doubled by the the violas and so on, and then the octaves on top. Um, yeah, so I mean, if you've got a crescendo happening here in your in your strings, I think that will be enough to balance with the kind of brighter sound of the trombones and trumpets. It works pretty good in the mock-up too. And then here you're trading off to um, your reeds right in here, which also works beautifully. Yeah, and just a little touches of of timpani. Yeah, I mean, that all works for me. And then, um, then here you're you are getting much more energy. You know, bum ba bum. But I, I like the fact that it isn't, uh, it isn't just a solid block 
of um, of instruments all working together. You're adding on winds as you go, and um, and more energy here from from your tuba and so on, kind of trading off with uh, kind of dancing back and forth with these uh, lower pitches. I'm not too I'm not too excited about this roll. I think that it it basically distracts from these functions right in here. You know, it just you know sort of like what is the ear really hearing there? It's just you know what I mean. It isn't really hearing da 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 bum, which I think is much more essential. Okay, and then um, <laughs> going on into this part here. Uh, here you're saying you're putting in a gap because that would be the effect of the of somebody with small hands kind of breaking things up. Um, you know, I mean that might be true for um, that might be well. I mean, see, like I <clears throat> here's the thing is that um, Violina has smaller hands and she doesn't. You know, she manages to not to not have a gap there and also. Recall that in these bars, um, there is no there is no solid downbeat, right? The downbeat is in the chord. So you may be remembering the piece wrong here, but I mean, like you do, you don't have to justify it at all, right? You know, you're saying, oh well, I you know we could do it this way, and and you know, and and that simulates this effect or that effect, you know, whether that is really something that happens or not probably doesn't you don't need to you do not need to justify anything at all I understand like the the coolness of it right um, and like here we're kind of getting into what I call like the Ravel part right so it just really feels uh, Ravel like this is interesting Poco Alagondo a tempo and this is yet another score where you know like really the Alagondo is here not here um, I, I feel that Barvinsky wanted to press into the next part, into the big, massive crashing part for the pianist, so that he put the allegato here. You know, uh, 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 you know. All right, but in terms of the scoring, a pretty solid um, tutti scoring right in here. Um, you know, just maybe one thing is like you're you are. You know, we we here we are in a forte. Here we're in a nice, a nice, beautifully scored two T. And you've been around the block a few times with these orchestration challenges. You've heard my general objections to certain practices, and you are a really um, accomplished um, orchestrator. You know, you're. You know, so so why do we have a an invisible? Why do we have invisible? second flute scoring in here right I'm, I'm seeing this again and again and I have gone over this point hundreds of times now okay and I'm, I'm not I'm trying not to be too scoldy but you're just too good of an orchestrator to do this I mean what 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 is the what is the second flute playing against trumpet in C right so here we have this B it basically destroys any chance of this flute having any meaningful um, contribution to something like this. And then once again the G, we see the G in the second trumpet. Now here when we get to this octave, this this is this is much more reasonable. But then you jump back down here um, and this uh, this second flute part is playing against your third horn. And so on, and this B, it's also just a weak place to position this. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I want you to watch out for this, okay? I, I, I want to, st I, I dream of a of future challenges in which I barely ever had to mention it, right? Especially with some of my, you know, some of my orchestrators who are basically turning out, you know, professional or near professional efforts. So yeah, so just really watch out on the second flute octave kind of thing. All right, it's 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 not, it is not um, 
it, it you know it, it almost feels like it is a bit of a shorthand like just kind of throwing it in like I'll, I'll do the flute octaves here and then I'll throw in all the other winds and then oh and then then by the time you get down to scoring the brass you've forgotten the fact that the second flute is just going to disappear right just use it wisely I would say use it wisely okay but you know the other stuff in here is is just really you know just very gorgeous well apportioned and yeah and nice and solid here on this tuba marcato accent exactly what it needs nice thump for the timpani i'm I, i'm i mean it, it does work that you don't put in a timpani stroke here but i miss it right see i'm i would rather you drop this and put in that or drop this and put in that right this is okay i, I understand what you're doing you're pushing towards um the uh, big climactic part, which we'll talk about in a minute. Okay, so yeah, so um, I all all that aside, one thing that I would say is um, consider the um, yeah. Okay, so you, like you're writing out Divisi and um, Unis, right? Unisona. Uh, just just write out D I V period U N I S period. Because writing out the full, writing out the full text is it's just it's more stuff visually, right? You just have to, have to imagine there are only so many thousands of things <laughs> that the that your violinist wants to look at at once, and the entire full word of unisono is not one of them. All right, so just just um, just the abbreviated versions, please. Nothing fancy. Just you know, just just you know, the the, the basics are, are all that anybody needs. Okay, um, and then then you have a couple other weird things like here. This is obviously a duet, right? In your in your bassoons because you have two stems. You have absolutely no need to to tell us that this is a duet. It is what it is. Now, if if these parts were on the same stem, if it were just a single voice here that were going to be playing two parts, then you would tell us a two, right? A duet. But the, and it's the same here. There is absolutely no need to tell us that this is a duet, right? A two. Right, just because you have separate stems, right? Separate stems. It tells us right there that this is two parts. We don't need you know the copyist and the conductor and the score reader do not need this extra bit of care that you're giving them all right so um so get, getting back to this i want you to consider something and that is like the more that you give harmony to your to your strings in um, in a very colorful kind of orchestration like this, the more subordinate they become to the winds. All right, and this is why we often see the strings in octaves while the winds play harmony uh, in a in like a harmonized passage like this. Now, I'm not saying what you did was wrong or bad or weak or anything like that, but um, you know here the color is really gorgeous, and then here you make a very wise decision to go to octaves. <laughs> on you know following the following the harmony so um so yeah it's just that like the shift here to to harmonization in the strings um when when i i just think that like you know here you went to like here you went to harmonization in the strings and you went to octaves and the flutes where you know where the 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 lower tone of that octave is is negligible in in weight or in meaning right musical meaning right it just doesn't really do a whole lot right it would, the musical meaning would come out if there were if it were less thick um there's also sort of a voice crossing here um yeah your your second violins above your first violins i would you know i would definitely change this around um these two bars because you know but like it just it's not so much you know who is more important who is better who should be on top or anything like that 
really has to do with the play, way the players are listening to each other. I would really prefer to to put you know in a, in a especially in a harmony like this. Uh, I know that the seconds are going to be listening to what the firsts are doing, and if they are the ones on top, you know that you know especially in a situation like this. I just I just feel that yeah that reversing the order I, it just it just reestablishes um, a, a, a clearer uh, you know a clearer division of duties and and a more reliable eventual effect all right all right I love the reverse um, glissando here the downward glissando very very cool all right so now let's turn the page yeah so. Yeah, so here we're getting into some some serious bashing around, and what's nice is that like you're you are a more sensitive orchestrator, right? So you are you know to a to a degree you really are pulling your punches, right? So you're so fortissimo crescendo, and then so you know to almost triple F, and then bringing it back down to forte. It will really feel like you have. Um, you've pulled things back considerably um it, it will almost feel like your people are playing softly right uh just compared to how big they got here especially in the brass so um you know it's probably the easiest way to to analyze this is just to kind of look at the overall proportions and then look at how the functions move through your arrangement you know, here is like a place where you are, you know, this this is the kind of scoring that could get a raised hand at rehearsal, okay? Because it implies that these symbols are growing in power as they sustain rather than decaying, right? So it might be better for you to, to like mark like fortissimo here, crescendo there. Right, so so that would just mean crash, 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 and then here uh, I would do the same thing: forte, forget, just cross off the hairpin, crescendo on this note, and then fortissimo there. All right, it's just because the hairpin just really does have the implication of of growing strength, and you don't really have very many repeated notes here. It just like, and especially like a lot of the hairpin is under a tied note, so. The, the risk is that somebody, you know, the 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 um, percussionist might, they might not, but they might raise their hands. Do you mean for this to be a roll on a on a uh, on a suspended symbol? Because you've got the you know you've got the hairpin increasing underneath a held note, right? I, which I can't do, right? Um, that's I mean probably probably wouldn't happen all that often, but it might. All right, so. Just you know, this is the this is a situation in which you know, especially um, like text works better than hairpins. All right, so let's start. Kind of, let's look at the bottom and then the top and then the middle. <laughs> okay, so uh, yeah, you know, like just some obvious choices here: um, contrabassoon and tuba in octaves together. Um, and then you got quite an active uh, double bass part, and I think that that really helps. Just the double bass kind of catching the rhythm, and you know, and then sometimes joining in on the on the melody and uh, taking more of a harmonic position along with some of your other instruments and so on. Um, and then here going to sixteenth uh, note uh, tremolos, I would write out the first one, or perhaps. Uh, yeah, I mean, I just, I just think it, you're going to need a little clarity here. Just there's always a risk. Like it's the sixteenth note tremolo, uh, the double beam. That is the thing that gets you into trouble because there are some parts from the um, from the nineteenth century and some other other scores where obviously what was intended was uh, unmeasured tremolo. Right, but you know, so like there's, uh, there's uh, when you when you are scoring out a part that looks like it could be unmeasured tremolo, 
you might get a raised hand. So it's like, I just want to make, make absolutely sure that you mean 16th notes here, right? And so that's why it like to get rid of that question, it might be good to like actually write it out. So I would write out the 16th here, and then I would write out the 16th just for um, maybe the first dotted quarter notes worth of duration, and then and then go to the abbreviation. All right, just just to be absolutely clear, and to not have that have any question in the mind of the player. And you might say, well, hey, I don't, you know, I've worked with professional players and there's just like no way that they would um, ever, you know, I, I cannot even imagine them ever asking to, uh, you know, ever, ever questioning that. Well, good for you. But there is a there is a possible chance that your your score might be played by a semi pro orchestra or by an orchestra that is professional, but they deal with people who don't know what they're doing a lot of the time because they do orchestral readings and stuff and so on and so like the question might arise out of concern and and you know really getting their part right and making sure not because they don't think you not because they think you can't score so you know so always just you know you know don't don't, don't assume anything try to help things as much as best you can all right so this always like <laughs> throws me for a loop looking at like this low A sharp. I was just like, is that still in the range of the contrabassoon? Yes, it is. You know, and of course easy for the um, for your tuba player. Okay. Now kind of looking at the overall dynamics, like in in context of everything else, um, really has a lot of surges, a lot of motion, and it's, it is almost too much. You take it right to the very edge, I think, of what, um, of, of what works. Okay, so I like this really big push here, and then you have a little surge, and then you have a bigger surge, right, to, to accompany this. But basically, the way that you have it scored this is the this is the climax of power right in here. This is just the the biggest, you know. This is the beefiest spot. So, in in light of that, you might want to rethink how powerful this gets right in here. All right, maybe this is the place that needs to go up to triple F. Maybe if it went up to triple F and then you went down to, you know, you you did a diminuendo to forte here, and then you could just keep it at forte instead of having another surge. Because maybe this doesn't need to have an arc to it. Okay, <clears throat> now let's look at the treatment of the melody. <clears throat> so yeah, so, so just very excitingly scored. I like, the, I like the fact that you have turned your melody into triplets from at, at play in places and I think that that's that's just very very powerful um, yeah and and once again you're trading between instrumental groups you know um, flutes and oboes uh, clarinets in a triple octave uh, doubling the triple octave here in your upper strings and then <laughs> Then it was really fun how you you come in here with um, you like you drop it an octave, um, and then you are adding trumpet uh, first trumpet and and uh, third horn, and here like double basses below. So so getting back to like the double the the double basses playing this, I feel that it's just not quite strong enough the double bass part here but but the the problem is that if you beef this up and maybe you know <clears throat> give some of this to say you know you could you could have um, one of your bassoons double this right without without um, distracting your contra bassoon player or had you chosen to add a bass clarinet part it would have been perfect However, um, if you put too much weight, then it then it takes away from the emphasis of of your low notes, and and to make matters even more complex, you throw in this roll in the timpani, 
right? And I mean, I, I see <laughs> what you're doing here with this. This roll is a melody note, right? But, uh, <laughs> you, you know, I mean, this this is one of those places where I feel it the the function becomes unclear, right? This isn't this role is not clarifying the melody for the double basses. So it, it's problematic. And also because the um, just the rippling sound of a timpani at uh, a timpani roll at fortissimo as a way of, of subtracting from the from what is above it, right? The, especially the middle strings, I would say. All right. Uh, but let's continue on um, wending through the melody. All right, so um, we are back to our stack right here. Um, with, uh, with a slight deviation here. This is not uh, D sharp below, but uh, G sharp. So it's, you know, sort of harmonization and, um, and so on. So, and that is doubled by basically just this uh, trumpet part in the middle, right? And so just kind of using it, you know, having having the top pitch um, doubled. And since you brought everything down here, uh, and and um, and you know, to to what will feel like you know a softer dynamic, even though it's forte, it sort of works. You know, um, the the one caveat I would have is the um, is that like the the contrast of going from here to this big burst, right? Which would be a really strong argument against not going to triple F here, right? So like if you do that, it really it really is way too much of an increase. But yeah, um, and then then of course this just is really going to be all about the winds because you haven't done any higher doubling with your strings. You could easily have done that, though, um, right? Um, jumped everything up an octave, but uh, you know, I mean, you have a nice color going on here, and uh, I, I respect how you are sort of telescoping things a little bit as you subtract elements and so on. Um, all right, so now to just kind of look at the the middle part. Um, it's, you know, I, I probably, probably normally wouldn't have to pick it apart so much except that for the fact that you trade off to different elements and the trade-offs are what's, are what's fascinating. So, yeah, so I think that this is a really solid approach right in here. Um, having your horns and your bassoons going chunk, 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 you know, and some cello in that too. Uh, and having the, um, your heavy brass doing the arcing, um, uh, you know, taking the, the sort of arcing function right in here. You didn't need to do this though, right? I mean, just because the just because the right hand has to reach over and go ting, you know, on this melody note here in the piano part doesn't mean that you have to interrupt it, right? You could just go da 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 da. You know, I mean, you you don't have to you don't have to put in all the rests, okay? The way that the the way that the piano score did, fill things in. Yeah, so, and then you've got bassoons joining in as the uh, cellos and uh, horns become kind of more emphatic in hammering away at things. Yeah, I mean, just nice little trade-offs of function that, that keep everything fresh for all the players. And, you know, trombones continuing along with flutes playing it above and middle strings right in here. Yeah, and then once again, I just really feel like here's where things are kind of at the weakest because of the timpani roll. Um, but, I mean, considering that people are just going to be hearing the trombones right in here and not really the middle strings so much, it's it's a gamble worth taking. And then trombones and clarinets, some repeated notes here in the cellos and bassoons again, um, and then arcing functions you're pretty much keeping it solid through the the trombones up to this point um, and repeated notes in trumpet and and horns and cellos yeah just a really nice just 
just trading one off to the other, the arcing and the bassoon here, the arcing and the clarinets and the horns, uh, and the middle strings, uh, repeated notes in your trombones and trumpet. Yeah, and then, um, like here, things are becoming much more regular, bassoons and, and, uh, uh, and trombones, repeated notes in the middle strings, and then joining together on the arcing patterns. And, you know, it's sort of like, even though you've got this crescendo here, it really is obvious that you are reducing the amount of weight as you go forward. So it really is more of a of a sound that boils down to, you know, as as there is a crescendo here, the horns really are absorbing, horns and bassoons, and strings are really absorbing everybody else's falling off notes. And you know, that is a really lovely effect. So I don't know if that was intentional, but it worked really well, really, really well, and sets this up nicely see like here like this is this makes more sense with a long hairpin like a rolled note right or like here this is cool because like these are these are like over a hairpin because it's a it's a sequence of notes right it's just this is just kind of awkward I would just say forte crescendo like get rid of the hairpin forte crescendo fortissimo and then here same thing this is a tish right so tish and then crescendo here. And then that's that's just clearer to the player. They won't think, oh, you know, does he mean that this is a suspended symbol now and this should be a roll? And it's always a possibility that that might occur to somebody with this kind of a hairpin, I would say. I'm probably overstressing it, but all the same. Now, let's go back to the beginning. And I, I think this is so cool, just the way everything is set up. Now, here is sort of where I felt that the harps um, really kind of sounded, I mean, especially the, the harp sound set really sounded like it was recorded in a closet, right? It just really felt a little unnatural, a little a little too isolated and, and closed in. Um, yeah, uh, and there was this one other issue. Yeah, right in here, um, everything sounded staccato but it's not marked st staccato and i'm wondering if you set it to staccato like set the uh, the articulation style here so i mean i think that if you are okay you know if you're fine with the way that the mock-up sounded then you should mark the staccato in here right but if you are not okay with the way that it sounded and you just wanted normal notes i would say there's something wrong with your sound set because there's things shouldn't be that that pointed in just a line like this I mean, I I was just a little, you know, I was a little perplexed myself. I I mean, I could I could see how that would be kind of a fun, different articulation style, but just the way that you had everything so smoothly set up here with these other instruments and so on. I mean, yeah. So like here, you've got staccato here. So so yeah. So yeah. Hmm. With timpani, with piccolo. All right. So this is another issue that. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, you can you can sort of put some of these things in, but the, the players perceive that. I would not say with this person, with that person, unless A, they were playing a prominent line um, that required coordination, you know, and uh, B, that those notes were identical, right? Because most of the time the players are, are going to get the fact that they have a relationship with another part just fine. Yeah, so here's what I was talking about in terms of like writing out a group of sixteenths, and you might think, well, look, I did that before, so why do I have to do it further on? I would say if it, if you haven't had that abbreviation for a while, and it's just really crucial, like where things could possibly be misunderstood. And let me tell you, it's just that the sixteenth note tremolo beams, those are the those can be some of the most misunderstood, right? Um, especially with a reading. A new composer the orchestra hasn't hasn't run into before they might think that you you have gotten it wrong so I'm just like it's just a just a matter of eliminating the the raised hand at the rehearsal or you know even worse having the having them assume that you mean something different okay so let's get back to the beginning and I'll, I'll stop overdoing it on the on the finessing and so on Okay, this is really lovely here. Uh, horn and oboe in octaves. It doesn't really happen that much, and it's just really beautiful. So you've got this, you've got this beautifully mixed together. It's a lovely idea. 
but we've got one problem here. Actually, two. I'll, the second problem is not that hugely critical. But the first problem here is that you have scored your flutes. You've enclosed your flutes between your oboe and your French horn. That's not, it's not a huge crisis. Don't, don't worry. Uh, but the problem is that you've marked it pianissimo. All right, now maybe, maybe that sounds good in your sound set. But uh, once again, like it's just you, just, you do not want to suppress the flutes, right? And you might be thinking, well, you know, I have them pianissimo because I really want the oboes to be the, um, you know, the leading voice. Well, they will be the leading voice. You, you do not have to worry about the, you know, the flutes are not going to outplay the oboes here. But, so all you're doing by turning them, you know, changing them to pianissimo is submerging them below both the overtones of the oboes and those of the French horns, even more critical, or the French horn part, even more critical. All right, so if you're going to say one here, there's absolutely zero need for you to have a, um, a second voice rest. And if you're going to have a second voice rest, there's absolutely zero reason for you to have the number one here, right? But then you would have to maintain second voice rests throughout the entire passage. All right, you pick one or the other, right? It's either number one or it's the second voice rest, right? Because they both mean the same thing. It's, um, what do they call that? A tautology. Like, for instance, you don't do that here, right? Here you have the number one and you don't, right? So maybe this is just something that, that has, has kind of migrated into the score from, um, you know, from your notation application. I'm not going to assume it's Dorico. Like I, you know, like sometimes when I see really, really beautiful, clean, clear uh, scoring, I'll assume it's Dorico and somebody will say, well, actually that's Finale and I'm really good at it, you know. <laughs> um, or, I'll, or I'll assume something is, you know, Muse score and they'll say, well, that's Dorico, you know, what are you talking about? So like a lot of, it, it, it just has to do with a lot of, um, a lot of engraving rules and, and looks being sort of shared. And I, I think that there's an attempt now to sort of like, um, you know, have a, have a certain look, which actually is not, is not the same look like that. You can tell by the brackets, right? That this isn't, that this isn't a Sibelius. All right. So, um, anyways, to get off of that subject, uh, and this is really lovely The you know, you, you don't, you increase the intensity just by adding, you know, the, 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 the crescendo doesn't really do it. It's the addition of more parts. And I think that those, these are really beautifully scored. Um, and you solve a bunch of problems here. Like, you know, for instance, if you think of my evaluation criteria as shared at the beginning of this video, you do, you have a beautiful emotional and timbral progression here. You um, add a little bit of lower weight here and there to keep things from being too middle register. Sorry about all the rattling that you might be hearing from upstairs. It's um, um, We're cleaning up the house because we have a special visitor coming in about an hour. Yeah, so I feel that this is beautifully scored. I'm not so sure that you need to go to uh, a unison part here. I think a single clarinet will will do perfectly fine. I don't think it needs to be doubled here. And I think they would just improve the tone weight, especially with the um, clarinet being under the oboe here and being a, uh, being a partner to the the clarinets in terms of, you know, um, in terms of harmonization and so on. All right. Uh, and now, like, do you really want this to be pianissimo going forward, right? Wouldn't it be kind of nice to be piano? It's, there's no question that they'll balance with the harp because there's, it's just almost completely naked here. One little caution that I would have here, and, and, and it's, you know, up to about right here, it is not a critical problem. And that is pizzicato tends to dominate when playing along with harp. Now you have you've thrown in like it's pianissimo you're trying to keep it in the background and everything is great right however however when you get to here this this joint e in the harp right and the f sharp in the basses and so on and like it just really there is a real risk that the harp will will get a little outplayed you know even with the difference in dynamic and everything else right so just just be careful like and i wouldn't bring this up if it weren't for the fact that you are so concerned with extremely delicate sounds right 
So if you're interested in delicate scoring, just really watch out about combining pizzicato and harp together because the pizzicato almost always wins you know, because you've got it's one player with nice long gushy strings versus you know up to 12 sometimes you know in a huge orchestra you might even have you know 13 or 14 cellos but let's say a, about a maximum of a dozen usually a dozen cellos all plucking their note right so who wins it's the cellos all right but you know this is really lovely the way that this is scored with the harp um, and it's just kind of yeah a pity that the harp sounds a little boxed in here and then yeah da 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 ba dum bum I'm not even sure that you really need piccolo in here kind of like it's sort of like extra emphasis but what's really beautiful is the way that you end on this low flute note all right so so in a, you just I would encourage people to go back and listen to the way that this ends on this flute note here and how the flute really uh, kind of dominates here um, with that beautiful low note almost completely unaccompanied by everybody else like everything else is just dies away very quickly or is softer in this case with the first violins um, it is just really a beautiful throaty um, breathy sound and uh, it's just a shame when when this you know when it's taken for granted that the flute has more power than it really does and and a lot of low notes are thrown away in a tutti and so on so yeah so watch out don't do that in your scoring if you can help it all right now going on um, you know really just I really like the um, the slurring in here it shows some experience with uh, live string players or at least the study of them yeah, and yeah, oboes. Oh, okay, yeah, okay. Before I go on, what was the other problem? What's the what is the um what is the harmony here? You have to ask yourself, Gabi. Is it um are these uh are are is this a, a minor chord or is it a six chord, right? So is it a uh is it a 6/3 minor chord or is it a is it a six chord, like in other words the the melody note? represents the six of the D major, right? And then here this E represents the six of the G major. When you create an enclosure like this um, with, uh, uh, with B on the outside, the B becomes the root of the D third. And here the E becomes the root of the G third. And so what you're doing is you're transforming them into minor chords, right? By adding the octave below. And enclosing the thirds, that's the that's the risk, right? So, what it what it does um, is it changes the context of the of the piece. It sort of dials it back ten or twenty years to being a romantic piece rather than an impressionist piece, right? So, with the maintaining the the maintaining the pitch order of the original harmony in um, in Barvinsky's prologue here. Um, you maintain the feeling of impressionism, right? So impressionism is more than just about drifty, dreamy orchestration. It also is about chord voicings, right? And that's that's one. Now, like for most of it, it's not a big problem. But just right in here, you know, you have to really think about like what is like you you may rearrange things so that they have a really beautiful color, but does that change the whole context of the style of the piece, right? So watch out for that. Okay, so back to this. See, like, and this came up again because I was looking at this, and you do it again, right? So you've got your B octaves and so on, and you've got your enclosure of the of the harmony in the middle, right? So, so really, so this is a B minor chord, and this is an E minor chord, rather than you know the context. But it doesn't matter because the context, right? You you are telling us that this is a D below, right? So it doesn't feel so much like an inversion of a B minor chord, and especially in the context of everything else, like really being very, um, you know, kind of D major-ish, right, with the interpretation of the left-hand pattern. Um, one thing I would say is watch out about going to the root, right? So here you go to the root of G. Um, and that sort of gives the game away. Barvinsky is avoiding the root. Once again, that is a... Um, that is a uh, impressionist thing, right? 
So just hanging on to the hanging on to the D, hanging on to the D, not telling us the root. He never gets to the root of G in this passage, right? He ends up he just just sits on D and sits on D until finally he gets to E minor at the end. All right. Um, so all those nitpicks aside, it, you know we're seeing kind of a, a, a an approach at least for this piece of of really changing around functions and and you know and putting weight different weight of for different parts um you know having like for instance here having the uh, the trombone first trombone uh, supplement what's going on in the in the uh, the cellos and the and the contrabassoon here and so on I, I would say this is a little clumsy the way that the uh, the way that the double basses are kind of kind of hammering away, you know, and um, and really taking more of an active role in here. I think it's 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 just a lot of weight down below, especially with the you know with your measured tremolo. Uh, it you know it, it makes it very bassy just right when you want it to be at its most floaty. Do you know what I mean? But yeah, but I mean it's still it's it it, it works, but just watch out for the weight. All right, and then ya da da dum. It's kind of nice this little this little um, uh, phrase right in here. Uh, the thing about it is that you you have to watch out for falling off, right? So I always like to complete little little fragments like this rather than just having them disappear because like the the sound of the rest becomes part of the sound of the fragment, right? So you could go ya da da a. And then just die away really, really quickly in the flute, right? So that it's just you know, so it doesn't feel like you just threw something in there, right? Which you did, <laughs> right? Which is perfectly fine. Yeah, and once again, I don't think you need to say with basses. I, th I think that it's it's in the music the people can hear it. They'll, they'll be fine. You know, if it truly were with the basses, there would be a crescendo, right? And the the pitches would be pretty much exactly the same. And and the the players would really be trying to like work together and and just get the exact same kind of a thing, but like it isn't the same pitches, right? So, um, but anyways, that's just that's just, that's just the way that I have I have worked with that using that particular thing. Maybe maybe some people are more generalized with it, right? So do you, yeah? So do you want da ta? Ta 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 ta, right? I think that that yeah. So that that's fine. Yeah. So is the you know yeah. All right. All right. Okay. I'm with you. I just had a question about dynamics there, but it's all good. All right. All right. So we get to our mezzo forte here. Um, and uh, I really love the way that you toss the melody back and forth between sections. You know, you've got this, you know, just kind of question and answer period, right? <laughs> with your, um, with your main constituents, flute, oboe, clarinet, bassoon, uh, plus a little trombone here, and then trading off to clarinet, horn, trombone, tuba, right? And, and some cello is kind of also helping out. Yeah, and just kind of back and forth. It's just such a lovely idea. And then here, bringing it in. So, like, I really don't have in too many comments here. Uh, I think that this is a lovely tuba part right in here. You don't let it get to be too insane. Yeah. Um, if there was an intention here for this line here in, in double bass to be seen to kind of connect or support or lead to the clarinet right in here, I think it just needs a little bit of, you know, there need, would need to be a little bit more continuity. All right. Now, um, getting to your interpretation of the wandering lines. All right. I have a problem with this. Okay. And my problem is not the fact, not using the harp in the way that you've got it. My problem is using trumpet, flute, bassoon, clarinet, and so on. Uh, in a way that where they have an have some kind of dynamic arc, which in this case is diminuendo, right? Um, I feel that everybody should be really soft right at the beginning, and they should all fade away together at the same rate, 
and they should get the hell out of the way by the time the harpist gets to the top here. And, you know, if possible, the trumpet should be even triple P, right? And, you know, you, if there's any kind of simplification, a toning down, um, you, you know, like cohesion to this so that it is something that just floats in the background and does not get in the way that would be the best. Because here's the thing. This is a long time to get from a glissando from this low E all the way up here to this G. Okay, so so what do you think happens during that time? What you're asking for is a fl is a slow glissando where the fingertips are basically just kind of kissing the strings on their way up. Now, if your glissando is loud, then you get this really stupid sound like dong 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 dong. You know, just sort of like you know just kind of like ripping your like kind of like sort of like fingertips across a like a, like a, one of those old style radiators um uh in a you know in an apartment okay but it can be just this thrillingly beautiful sound of the fingertips just just brushing the strings as they go upwards okay so that is such a delicate sound at this slow speed that this really has to be back. It just has, and like, I mean, I would not even choose trumpet here. I would choose some instrument that can just really fade away into nothing as much as possible, right? Just really try to tame what's going on here. I mean, strings would be a much better choice, right? Because they could just hang in the air and just be incredibly soft. And, you know, but the problem is that the overtones of all of these instruments, even at this soft these soft pitches and especially the way that you have stacked the trumpet and the flute on top of each other they will interfere with the focus of attention on that beautiful rippling sound of the slow fingertip glissando well, I mean all all glissandos are fingertip but the slow brushing of the fingertips across the strings as they go from here to there right and I just feel that this is this jinxes it right it just it it gets in the way of the audience going oh my god did you hear the harp it was so gorgeous it'd be more like you know their impression of this would be yeah you know, i love that part with a you know where the harp did this kind of strange thing while the those beautiful flute and trumpet was fading away that was wonderful and then there's a little bit of harp afterwards do you see what i mean so like that this creates a disconnect in the focus of the listener so this needs to be fixed I think trumpet is too much. I think the harp, I sorry, I think the flute goes on for too long. I think everything needs to be tamed down and focused down into just a really gorgeous cohesive color that gets the hell out of the way of this beautiful ripple on the way up, right? And then and then you can get away with, you know, not having the you you know what I mean? You you can get you can get away with not having an interpretation of this. Okay, well, continuing on. Uh, this is it's just really cool the way you elevate <laughs> the um, these functions here uh, like you know taking it up into the stratosphere with a piccolo uh, it's really really lovely yeah so and, and yeah so definitely mark the staccato if you obviously mean staccato from before right just yeah I mean you might be thinking well look I marked staccato here so I kind of don't need to mark it there but yeah you do especially coming after these slurs and um, this is one of the first um, orchestrations I've seen where the where the like the left hand accompaniment turned into the descending line, and I thought that was a very cool idea. Nice rearrangement of functions, and just a little bit of tuba below, right? It works fine. You know, I would put the crescendo mark. I would put the hairpin here. I wouldn't cross the rest here. Right, because like you're kind of saying, what are they going to crescendo while they're holding this A? No, obviously not. So put the crescendo from here. Yeah. You know, just kind of one last little fiddly question. If this is slurred, and this is slurred, why isn't this slurred? Right. So yeah. So think about that. I think that if this is slurred, this should match up, right? I don't think you should have the staccato over the slur in this part where you're going to eventually join together. 
I think it, it spoils the phrasing. Okay, so last little section right in here. Um, coming back to the harp as the as the melodic instrument. Um, yeah. And I, I think that this works fine. I don't think you need to mix the strings down or the harp up or anything like that. But I definitely would write solo here. Yeah, and then like big hand over hand rolls. It was all really, really gorgeous. Right, and then here you have oboe and English horn coming in. Um, excuse me, excuse me. Um, it's just so confusing. C A, cl in A. You know what? I, I think that you can like you you. There is no clarinet in B flat part. You don't need to say clarinet in A in your abbreviated uh, names in your short names. And the same same like here. F horn in F. All you need to do is just say horn in the middle there. You don't need to say trumpet and C. All you need is TPT period. Yeah, you know, well, that could turn into a nice big gripe from me. I'll save that gripe for later. Okay, so, so excuse me, I misread. So, oboe and clarinet. So, well, you know, about my only observation here would be that, like, this should be English horn. Absolutely. And the reason why is that um, you are coming, you're playing it against a, a harp part. So you want an instrument that is going to be able to just come in as soft as butter, right? And this is a fairly low note for oboe. Most top professional oboe players will be able to play this low C and make it sound soft, just like Scheherazade. But, you know, you get this part, you get this played by a semi-pro orchestra and it might not be so soft, right? So just think about, like, I'm not saying worst case scenarios are always the best way to judge what to do, but I do think that, like, it's just it just works better on English horn. So just go for the option that works better. All right. You know, but, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, da, da. And yeah, and then just the little answer in trombones. And, like, here, is the harp still important? Don't score, score trombone at the same dynamic level. Pinissimo on these parts. Yeah, a lovely, lovely tuba part in there. Yeah, and and you know I I like the fact that you're kind of keeping the the those octaves um, at the beginning. They are um, you know they're audible, but they're not kind of you know they're not taking over the music too much. However, we're going forwards. Da 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 da. Uh, da 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 dum. So the nice trading off between the parts, French horns and so on and so forth. Strings. Da da dum. Here is the place at which your octaves become too weak to maintain. You, you know the 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 intention of the function here. I just feel that they're just they're just not strong enough. I mean here, yeah, the fade out is to pianissimo and so on and so forth. But just these three bars right in here. Um, and you can hear it in the mock-up, or rather I could, should say you can't really hear it in the mock-up, right? So I think this is a place where whoever is available to help should help out, right? You don't need louder cellos and double basses, you need stronger, right? You need a stronger function. So yeah, so I just feel that it's a little underpowered right in here, and you know, going to the bassoons here as well. Yeah, I mean, there's got to be somebody who can help out here. You know, even if it's just you know, a little bit of second violin or something, those, those pitches are within reach. Yeah, somebody needs to help out a little bit more in here on this octaves. Otherwise, it's just, you know, beautiful. I love the idea of combining the bassoons and the horns here in that way. And, you know, just, just a little touch of trumpet here nicely nicely behind the oboe and the english horn and octaves and and everything else it's just it's really really beautifully scored all right so um i will stop there because <laughs> i you know, pretty much said what i could say about it there there were definitely more parts that we could go over and if i have been <coughs> a bit picky and um uh, and kind of gone over some points of finessing. It is because your score is so finessed. You know, you have you have spent so much time on 
really like shaping the most exquisite, um, careful proportions between things, right? And I feel that, you know, that's where I really like my advice would be its strongest, right? And and so if I, you know, if I kind of go over certain points over and over again, um, then I, I apologize if I'm repeating myself too much. Um, but yeah, but I, I just feel that like you have so, you know, just really a gifted orchestrator and, uh, and you know, the finer points like you, you've gotten past the obvious stuff. The finer points are really something to focus on, and and they are a good, you know, they're a good point of reference for a lot of other people watching these lectures, right? So thank you so much for that amount of attention that you put into your score. It's really wonderful, and for the effort that you put into it, and you know, for supporting me on Patreon through these, um, you know, through the months of us. Um, raising some money for some desperate musicians that was very very um you know very much appreciated by me and undoubtedly by them um and and you know to everybody else out there on patreon who helped out with that or and, and you know people who've come and gone um today i got a message from somebody apologizing for you know having to drop out of patreon for a while and look you know don't ever worry about that folks you know, the fact that you're able to help me a little bit at all, you know, my fellow musicians, you know, we are, we are not like, we are not the richest people in the world. And the fact that we can help each other sometimes like this is, you know, whether it's helping out with that appeal or just helping me keep things going on Patreon so I can help other musicians. Um, that's just a, a daily miracle to me. And, um, and nobody needs to apologize if they come and go, all right? So thanks to all of you. Thank you, website subscribers, viewers. And um, <laughs> this is just the first of three videos I'll be releasing today. So stay posted for those. And thanks, everybody, once again. I'll see you soon.